All right, hello, and welcome to another ranking video. This is my top 10 James Bond films. They're almost on every weekend in the UK. It's like a way of life. You must eat fish and chips, drink plenty of tea, and watch Bond. From Doctor No in 1962, all the way to No Time to Die in 2021, Bond has starred in, officially, 25 films. I can count the number of films I don't enjoy on one hand, and I'd still have fingers left over. So if your favourite doesn't appear on this list, it doesn't mean I dislike it. It was just tough to narrow it down to the top 10. It goes without saying, this video will contain spoilers for a lot of these films. With that being said, let's start the countdown at number 10. My name's Bond. James Bond. Starting off the list, we have Live and Let Die. Roger Moore's first outing as Bond, and he starts off very strong. When you watch back Moore's era of Bond, it's very campy, over the top, and very bizarre in some places. But Live and Let Die is so much more gritty, grounded, but also a fun ride. You have the beautiful solitaire, played by the wonderful Jane Seymour. Pick a card. Hand it over. You have found yourself. Quite possibly the most enchanting Bond woman. It's unclear whether the voodoo in this film is real, or if it's just a tactic used by Kananga. A way of threatening anyone who comes close to his operation. The theme song is iconic, and quite possibly my favourite Bond song. Unfortunately, because this is YouTube, and they might shout at me, I can't use too much of the song, but I think we all know it. I wouldn't say Live and Let Die has the most action scenes compared to the other Bond films, but the boat chase is a personal favourite of mine. One negative I do have about this film, though, is the death scenes. Are we really to believe Baron Samadhi just falls into this trunk filled with snakes and just dies? Those must be some very powerful snakes. That's nothing compared to Kananga, who just blows up. He literally explodes like a balloon and literally just full of air. Nothing inside of him, just air. This doesn't feel like it's part of the film. It just looks more like an outtake. They told me you were assassinated in Hong Kong. Yes, this is my second life. You only live twice, Mr. Bond. In at number nine is You Only Live Twice. The last of Sean Connery's first run as Bond, before he was convinced to return for Diamonds Are Forever. You can tell he isn't quite at his best in this film. And by this point he was tired of playing Bond. Which is a shame, as the rest of the film is amazing. Ah, oh, welcome to Japan, Dad. Is my little girl hot and ready? Look, 007, I've had a long and tiring journey, probably to no purpose. And I'm in no mood for your juvenile quips. You have the iconic volcano lair. The reveal of Blofeld. Great set pieces and action throughout. There is a bizarre moment where Bond has to pretend to be Japanese. Gombawa. And let's be fair, he isn't fooling anyone. I have more chance of convincing people that I'm a space alien. Just don't look too close to the plot. Sit back and enjoy. I have placed The World Is Not Enough at number 8. Pierce Brosnan gets quite a lot of unwarranted hate for his tenure as Bond. Now yes, Die Another Day is awful and won't be anywhere near this list. I'm sorry Die Another Day fans if there is any out there. 
but his other outings as Bond are all great fun. Now sure, having Denise Richards as Dr. Christmas Jones is maybe not the greatest piece of casting, but we know a lot of female actors in Bond films don't always get their roles based on acting ability. Dr. Jones, Christmas Jones, and don't make any jokes, I've heard them all. I don't know any Dr. Jokes. The opening action is among my favourite, if not possibly my favourite Bond opening. This was also the first time where arguably the main villain is female. Electra King is electrifying and has great chemistry with Pierce Brosnan. It is also Desmond Llewellyn's final appearance as Q, who he had played since From Russia With Love way back in 1963. This is the definition of a comfort movie. A big bowl of pasta on a cold winter's day. Now pay attention, 007. I want you to take great care of this equipment. There are one or two rather special accessories. Q, have I ever let you down? Frequently. In at number seven is The Spy Who Loved Me. The film that helped cement Roger Moore as Bond, as he did have some trouble convincing people he was up to the task, especially considering Sean Connery has some quite ginormous shoes to fill. The opening scene where Bond parachutes off the cliff got a standing ovation at the premiere, and you can see why, it's a fantastic stunt. When I think of Bond films, I think of cars, stunts, villains, and Bond's many, 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 many female partners. X. Bond, what do you think you're doing? Keeping the British end up, sir. On paper, this ticks all those boxes. There's the iconic Lotus Esprit that turns into a submarine, and it's something I think every kid wanted when they were young. The villains. I mean, you can't get more iconic than Jaws the most menacing of all the henchmen. The villain's base is a giant structure that can rise out of the water for crying out loud. How cool is that? Then you have Anya, another agent, but one that's working for the KGB, and swears to kill Bond after the mission for killing her partner at the beginning of the movie. And she is one of the first to be portrayed as Bond's equal. The only negative is the main villain. Maybe a bit forgettable and is overshadowed by Jaws. He isn't terrible by any stretch of the imagination, but not a villain you'll remember much about once the movie has ended. I admire your luck, Mr... Bond. James Bond. At number six we have Doctor No, the first film in the franchise. It's maybe less ambitious than future movies, but what it lacks in special effects it makes up for in pacing, storytelling and just pure fun. It's one of the shorter Bond films and is such a lovely watch from start to finish. Sean Connery is my personal favourite Bond. He just has that right balance of charm, toughness, and wit. I'm working for... Mr. Smith and Weston. And you've had your six. You also have the iconic scene of Ursula Andres in a bikini, emerging from the ocean. One of the most beautiful women to ever live. Scenes in this film never drag or end up convoluted. It's just easy to follow and great nostalgia from a bygone era of filmmaking. The mysterious Doctor No is kept hidden for a large majority of the movie, which does mean he gets very little screen time, which is a shame. The locals are afraid to venture to Crab Key in fear of a dragon, which feels more like Scooby-Doo rather than James Bond. Doctor No would have gotten away of it if it wasn't for that meddling Bond. Effective immediately. 
your license to kill is revoked. And I require you to hand over your weapon. At number five is quite possibly my most controversial pick. A lot of people rank this film very low and I don't quite see why. I think it was way ahead of its time. This is the Bond we see in the Daniel Craig era. God, what a terrible waste of money. There seems to now be more of an appreciation for Timothy Dalton's Bond, which is fantastic because both his Bond films are great. Sure, it feels a little bit like Miami Vice in places, but Bond films always mirrored the popular culture of their decades. Just look at Moonraker and Star Wars, for example. Sanchez is an amazing villain. He is just smooth, charming, pretty much just like Bond, really. He's basically an evil version of Bond. This is also one of the most violent and bloody Bond films, which didn't quite help its release at the time, since it got a very high age rating in the UK. The action is some of the best you'll see in a Bond film. The last section with the tankers is just pure gold. Stunts galore, Bond music blaring, explosions everywhere. What more could you want? Shot. Into the top four and finally Daniel Craig makes an appearance. We have Skyfall, the highest grossing Bond film of all time. And for good reason. It's an emotional roller coaster. The opening is just pure adrenaline and gets you pumped for the rest of the film. We got to see a lot more of the MI6 team in this film, with Judi Dench as M getting her most prominent role. We got to see the new Q as well, who was missing from the first two Daniel Craig films. Also PPKS 9mm short. There's a microdermal sensor in the grip. It's been coded to your palm print so only you can fire it. Although gadgets are less important in modern times, with everything being on a smartphone these days. And the villain, Raoul Silver himself, a former MI6 agent. He was turned rogue and seeking revenge for M betraying him. A creepy, unhinged, but in a way charming man. To be fair, that does sum up about 99% of Bond villains, but he is one of the best. We also see the Aston Martin DB5. I'm not even a car fan, but this car is beautiful. It's just a shame it gets shot to pieces. Beg your pardon? Forgot to knock. We are now into the upper echelons of Bond movies with Goldeneye at number three, the first of Pierce Brosnan's films. At the time, there was a six year gap between this film and the previous one, The Living Daylights, which at the time was unconceivable to go so long without a Bond movie. And now this is about average. What I love about Bond is how each actor brings something different. Every generation gets a soft reboot and almost a clean slate to build from. And typically each Bond's first film is always a strong one. What is there not to love about Goldeneye? You have great villains. You have great action. The tank scene is just pure cheese, but it's amazing. It's what we love about action movies. It's completely unrealistic, but who cares? You also have Sean Bean getting impaled, because it's Sean Bean, as if he was going to make it to the end of the movie. I'm not sure why, but I'm a big Boris fan. No, 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 not that Boris, never that one. This one, his wacky Hawaiian shirts, his terrible Russian accent. What a goofball. Yes! I am invincible! Shame. We 
we've barely got to know each other. I know where you keep your gun. Just missing out on the top spot is Casino Royale. Daniel Craig's tenure was very hit and miss for me, as shown in this ranking. You have two films right at the very top, two mediocre films, and then you have the hot garbage that is Quantum of Solace. Thankfully, they started off with this masterpiece. We go back to the making of Bond, including how he became a double O agent. As mentioned previously, this is a gritty Bond. This feels more real, possibly inspired by the success of the Bourne films. Or possibly because they needed to do something after the steaming turd that was Die Another Day. Something you might not know about me is, I'm a poker fan. I used to play daily, so the whole casino scene where they're playing poker is just perfection for me. A straight flush. 4 to the 8. The high hand. Although I know for some that might not be the most exciting scene, but then you do get Bond when he's poisoned, which is a real heart-stopping moment. I also need to mention the tragic Vesper Lind, Bond's second true love, after Tracy in Her Majesty's Secret Service. But again, tragically, it was never meant to be. Such a great performance. To be fair, everyone is great in this film. It's once number two in my ranking. Before I reveal my number one spot, we have three honourable mentions. In the meantime, can you guess what film will be number one? Who are you? Bond, James Bond. Exercise Control 007 here. I'll report in an hour. Won't you join me? Better make that too. Red wine with fish. Well, that should have told me something. You may know the right wines. The other one on your knees. A billion people around this planet will watch it, hear it, and read about it from the Carver Media Group. There's no news like bad news. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Yes, it had to be Goldfinger, the gold standard of Bond films. This film will take some beating. It has the best villain of any of the Bond films, Auric Goldfinger. His plot to not steal the gold in Fort Knox, but to contaminate it with radiation, increasing the value of his own gold, is quite possibly the most insane get best villain scheme of all the movies. You have Sean Connery at his peak. At this point, he had been in two Bond films already and was now fully in the role of James Bond. Then you have Pussy Galore, which is surely the least subtle Bond woman innuendo from all the movies as well. Who are you? My name is Pussy Galore. I must be dreaming. Ignoring the fact that Bond turns her to his side by forcing himself upon her, in the book it's implied she's a lesbian that can be persuaded, which is a bit problematic, but it was different times. Bond is meant to be flawed. He's not meant to be a hero that everyone should want to emulate. Then we have the infamous odd job, the sullen, seemingly invincible strongman with his trademark killer hat. Yes, he literally throws his hat at people and kills them. This film just has everything I personally want from a Bond film. So there we go. That was my top 10 James Bond films. It will be interesting to see where the Bond films go in the future. Who might take over as Bond next? Do I dare start that debate? I hope you enjoyed this countdown. Let me know your favourites down in the comments. What did you agree with? What did you disagree with? But for now, take care and leave me alone.